The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. The webinar will begin soon. Please stand by. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Laura Morell, and I work in the National Center for Emerging and Zoonotic Infectious Diseases at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. On behalf of CDC's One Health Office, I'm pleased to welcome you to the monthly zoonoses and One Health Updates call on September 7, 2022. Next slide. Although the content of this webinar is directed to veterinarians, physicians, epidemiologists, and related public health professionals in federal, state, and local positions, the CDC has no control over who participates. Therefore, please exercise discretion on sensitive content and material as confidentiality cannot be guaranteed. Today's webinar is being recorded. If you have any objections, you may disconnect now. Links to resources from each presentation are available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2022 slash september.html. Next slide. Today's presentations will address one or more of the following five objectives. Identify an implication for human, animal, and environmental health. Identify a One Health approach strategy for prevention of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for detection of public health threats. Identify a One Health approach strategy for responding to public health threats. And list two ways to improve collaborative practice across the public health care team. Next slide. In compliance with continuing education requirements, all presenters must disclose any financial or other associations with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters, as well as any use of unlabeled products or products under investigational use. CDC, our planners, presenters, and their spouses and partners wish to disclose they have no financial interests or other relationships with the manufacturers of commercial products, suppliers of commercial services, or commercial supporters. The planning committee reviewed content to ensure there is no bias. The presentations will not include any discussion of the unlabeled use of a product or a product under investigational use. CDC did not accept commercial support for this activity. Next slide. Instructions for receiving free continuing education are available at cdc.gov slash One Health, slash Zohu, slash Continuing Education. The course access code is Zohu Webcast. To receive free CE for today's webcast, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by October 10th, 2022. A captioned video of today's webinar will be posted at cdc.gov slash One Health, slash Zohu, slash 2022, slash september.html within 30 days. To receive free CE for the web on demand video of today's webinar, complete the evaluation at cdc.gov slash TCE online by October 11th, 2024. Next slide. Before we begin today's presentations, Nadia Usayev, strategy and policy lead with the One Health Office will share some news and updates. You can begin when you're ready. Thank you very much, Laura. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us for the September Zohu call. Before our presentations begin, I'd like to share some updates. You can find links to the relevant resources in today's Zohu call email newsletter. If you aren't already subscribed to the newsletter, please use the link at the top of the main Zohu call webpage to sign up. You can check CDC's website for the latest COVID-19 guidance and resources, including information about keeping people as well as animals safe and healthy. There is no evidence that animals are playing a significant role in spreading COVID-19 to people, but we continue to see a variety of animals reported with SARS-CoV-2. 
the latest animal case numbers are available on the USDA APHIS website and guidance for pet owners, mink farmers, and many other resources are available on CDC's website. Next slide. Today's newsletter highlights several recent CDC-led publications, including one titled, Multi-State Reptile and Amphibian-Associated Salmonellosis Outbreaks in Humans, and a summary of possible multi-state enteric or intestinal disease outbreaks in 2017 through 2020. Next slide. The newsletter also highlights publications touching on recent events, including the papers, Evidence of Human to Dog Transmission of Monkeypox Virus, and Public Health Response to a Case of Paralytic Poliomyelitis in an Unvaccinated Person and Detection of Poliovirus in Wastewater, New York, June through August 2022. Next slide. And lastly, for publication, there's a report on the nationwide tuberculosis outbreak in the US linked to bone graft product and a blog post exploring microbial ecology to elevate the fight against antimicrobial resistant healthcare associated infections. Next slide. We've also shared links to announcements, including the CDC confirmation of two human infections with flu virus from pigs during 2022. Next slide. And web resources, including the resource repository for the influenza and zoonosis education among youth and agriculture program. Next slide. Here are some events and observances of interest, including National Food Safety Education Month and National Preparedness Month being observed for the entire month of September. And there's also World Rabies Day, which will be here before we know it on September 28th. Next slide. Finally, the newsletter has information on outbreak investigations, including a new E. coli outbreak with an unknown food source. Next slide. You can visit CDC's Healthy Pets, Healthy People website for a selected list of ongoing past US outbreaks of zoonotic diseases. We'd appreciate you sharing the Zohu Call website link with your colleagues from human, animal, plant, and environmental health sectors and letting them know about live webinars video recordings, and free continuing education call offers. Our next SOHU call will take place on October 5th. Please continue to send presenter and topic suggestions for future presentations, as well as news from your organizations to zohu call at cdc.gov. That's Z-O-H-U-C-A-L-L at cdc.gov. I'll now turn the call back over to Laura. Next slide. Thank you. You can submit questions at any time using Zoom's Q&A feature. Please include the topic or presenter's name with your question. The Q&A session will follow the final presentation if time permits. You can also email questions to today's presenters. We've included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Next slide. Our first presentation, Translocation of a Rabbit Anteater Resulting in Multiple Human Exposures, Tennessee, 2021, is by Dr. Heather Grohm. Please begin when you're ready. Thanks, Laura, and good afternoon, everyone. Next slide. On August 16th of 2021, the Tennessee Department of Health was notified of a positive rabies test from a South American anteater. This was surprising as no prior cases of rabies had been reported in the species. Southern tomatoes are found throughout much of South America. They eat mainly insects, such as ants and termites, using their long tongues, which can be up to 15 inches long. They're also frequently used in North American zoos as ambassador animals, starring in zoo educational programs to help build guests empathy for animals, and they allow safe, up-close interaction. Next slide. We investigated further and learned that Tomando originally lived in a safari-style drive-through zoo in Virginia for many years. 
The zoo offers visitors an opportunity to see and feed animals up close from their vehicles over a fenced 180-acre property. Next slide. In early May of 2021, the tomato was translocated from the Virginia Safari Style Zoo to a smaller sanctuary zoo in Tennessee. Next slide. In Tennessee, the animal was kept in this indoor habitat, which was isolated from the zoo visitors and wildlife. It was not permitted outside of the enclosure, and there was no known exposures to other species, which occurred. Next slide. It was also co-housed with one other tomando in the zoo, shown here. Next slide. On June 29th, the tomando began exhibiting signs of illness with lethargy, anorexia, and diarrhea. A local veterinarian and veterinary technician saw the animal at Clinic 1 on July 1st and treated it empirically with an antibiotic. However, it continued to worsen. Next slide. On July 6th, the animal was taken to Clinic 2 at a veterinary college for additional evaluation. The tomato was examined by multiple people, including veterinary residents and students. The staff reported frequent direct contact with the tongue during the exam, which was considered normal behavior because tomandoes frequently use their tongues to probe the environment. However, abnormal copious salivation was also noted in the medical chart. Routine diagnostics failed to reveal a cause of illness at that visit, and supportive care was unsuccessful in improving the animal's condition. Next slide. It was humanely euthanized and a necropsy was performed. So this included removal of the brain tissue using an electric oscillating saw. Gowns and gloves were used in the necropsy suite, although no other personal protective equipment, such as goggles or respiratory protection were worn. The brain tissue was then submitted to an academic laboratory for histopathology. The animal was not submitted to the state public health lab at that time for rabies testing because rabies was not considered a cause of illness for several reasons. First, there was no historical record of rabies in the species. Second, the animal had no known bite exposures. And third, tomandoas have a low body temperature of 91 degrees Fahrenheit. And low resting body temperatures in mammals are thought to help inhibit the replication of the rabies virus. Next slide. The laboratory unexpectedly reported a preliminary positive rabies test result approximately six weeks after the animal died. Tennessee Department of Health was notified at that time, and we immediately began an investigation into the unvalidated rabies result, as well as potential human exposures. Next slide. So next, I'll review some of the methods we used during our investigation. Next slide. Fixed brain tissue was sent to CDC's pox virus and rabies branch for confirmatory testing. Two methods were used to identify the presence of rabies virus an immunohistochemistry test, and RT-PCR assay. In addition, samples from the salivary gland were also sent to CDC. We were interested in the salivary glands because late in the disease, after the rabies virus has reached the brain, it moves from the brain to the salivary glands and saliva. Molecular characterization of the rabies virus was also performed. Next slide. We developed an assessment tool to identify persons potentially exposed to the tamandua. The questionnaire attempted to define the exposure each person had to the animal during the rabies viral shedding period or necropsy. We identified and interviewed all people who were in contact with the tomandoa during this time. And based on the responses of each person in the assessment, we recommended rabies post-exposure prophylaxis when indicated. Next slide. The rabies viral shedding period during this investigation was defined as 14 days before the onset of clinical signs, so starting June 16th, until the date of death on July 6, or any involvement in the necropsy. Next slide. And next, I'll share some of the results of our investigation. And next slide. On August 21st, rabies was detected in the brain of the tamandua by the immunohistochemistry test and by RT-PCR assay at CDC. So this confirmed the diagnosis of rabies. Next slide. Immunohistochemistry methods provide sensitive and specific means to detect rabies in formal and fixed tissues. For context, these are examples of negative and positive control samples used by the lab. These are images from the brain of a rabbit which died from rabies with viral inclusions shown in the positive control on the right. 
in red and indicated by the arrows. Next slide. And this is the immunohistochemistry result from the brain of the tamandua. Red stain here confirms the presence of rabies virus antigen using an anti-nucleoprotein rabies antibody. And as you can see, the tamandua clearly have rabies virus present in its brain at the time of death. The bright red in the right photo is highlighted nicely within the neuron of, a brain, of the brain. Next slide. Immunohistochemistry tests completed by CDC from salivary gland tissue was also positive. And here you can see an image from the tamandua salivary gland indicating the presence of virus. This was concerning because rabies virus is transmitted through direct contact, such as through broken skin or mucous membranes with saliva or with brain or nervous system tissue from an infected animal. Next slide. Molecular characterization was completed on the, the rabies virus of the tamandua compared with sequences from Tennessee, Virginia, and other nearby states. Uh, next slide. The Tennessee samples here are highlighted in orange. And next slide, thank you. Virginia samples are in blue, once more. And the Tamandua sample is in magenta with a star. You can see here that the rabies virus from the Tamandua clustered with virus sequences from the Northeast and Mid-Atlantic, which is shown with purple branching. And it was separate from the rabies virus with the Southeast, which is shown with the yellow branching. So this confirmed the similarity, similarities to the raccoon variant sequences from Virginia and helped us to focus on the Virginia safari style zoo as the likely source. Next slide. 22 people were potentially exposed. And of these, rabies post-exposure prophylaxis was recommended for 13 people, including six veterinarians, two veterinary students, four pathologists, and one zookeeper. 11 of these 13 have previously received rabies pre-exposure vaccination, and conditions for their potential exposure included known contact to saliva, with concern for saliva introduced to a scratch or open skin wound. And in addition, because barrier protection was limited during the removal of brain tissue using the electric oscillating saw, there was concern for potential exposure due to aerosolization of the brain tissue. So our pet was recommended to those operating the saw people less than 10 feet from the saw or anyone not confident of where they were in the room when the calvarium was breached. Next slide. And one more. Thank you. We made public health recommendations to the people and zoos involved. First, all people with exposures were recommended to receive RPEP and all 13 agreed to receive it. Next slide. The other Samandua remaining at the Tennessee Zoo received rabies vaccine and the zoo owner was advised to strictly quarantine the animal for six months. That animal remains healthy to date. Next slide. The Virginia Zoo was also notified regarding concerns for rabid raccoons on the property. The zoo owner confirmed the presence of native wildlife inside the fencing perimeter of the zoo and took action to remove them from his property. Next slide. And finally, we were able to provide additional education to the zoos and veterinary facilities about the importance of rabies pre-exposure vaccination in animal handlers who have regular animal interaction in rabies endemic areas. As of this presentation, no additional cases of rabies have been identified related to this case. Next slide. In summary, this case demonstrated human-mediated rabies translocation through the transport of an unvaccinated captive mammal. Expansion of rabies zones through translocation has major public health implications, including the potential for outbreaks among animals in locations where rabies is not present in the native wildlife. Owners of captive mammals should consider rabies vaccination for their animals that are not completely excluded from contact with rabies vectors like raccoons. The National Association of State Public Health Veterinarians Compendium on Rabies Control also recommends off-label vaccination for zoo animals, especially if they're part of a petting zoo or are a rare species. And finally, people who work regularly with animals in areas where rabies is present should consider pre-exposure vaccination due to the risk of exposure from unanticipated sources. Next slide.
Additional information about our investigation can be found in MMWR Weekly, published on April 15th of this year. Next slide. And I wanted to take a moment to acknowledge all of my co-authors for their hard work into this unique investigation, especially those at the Tennessee Department of Health. Next slide. And thank you all again for listening. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our next presentation, the projected expansion of coccidioidomycosis endemic regions in response to climate change is by Dr. Morgan Gorris. Please begin when you're ready. Great, thank you so much, Laura, and thank you all for joining today. I'm excited to share uh, some of our research uh, studying uh, mycoses um, called coccidioidomycosis, um, otherwise known as valley fever. Next slide. So valley fever is formally known as coccidioidomycosis and humans and animals can contract valley fever when they breathe in airborne spores from the fungus coccidioides. About 40% of people who will inhale the spores will become symptomatic. Symptoms like many other diseases will start flu-like, you'll have uh, fever, um, skin rash, and the disease can disseminate throughout the body and become fatal. Valley fever is not communicable, so it does not spread from human to human. So cases are a direct result from environmental exposure from the fungus. And it's recently become an area of interest because the total number of cases is increasing. So in the top right corner is a bar graph of number of cases in the reportable United States spanning from 1998 to 2019. And there's a clear increase in cases where in 1998, we were recording about 2,500 cases. And in 2019, this has reached uh, over 15,000 cases. Next slide. Oh, back up one slide, please. Thank you. So the fungus grows in the semi-arid soils in dry parts of the uh, Western United States and also parts of Central and South America. Uh, this is a diagram of the life cycle, uh, the environmental form of coccidioides. So in step one, we show that the fungus grows in these semi-arid soils. It grows in myce mycelial strands. So they're largely microscopic. Uh, strands growing in the soils, and they're these barrel-shaped spores connected together. So in step two, if there's any type of environmental stress like dryness, this causes the fungus to autolyze or break apart, and so those spores will break off from the chain. They're about two to five microns in length, so very small, and can easily become airborne. So in step three, those spores can become airborne from any type of soil disturbance. This could be digging in the dirt or a, a high wind event. And that's when humans or animals can breathe in the spores and become sick with valley fever. Next slide. So at the time of our study, uh, the CDC valley fever endemicity map was based off of a skin test reactivity study by Edwards and Palmer from 1957. So this map shows uh, much of the southwestern United States as um, suspected, established, or highly endemic. Uh, the highly endemic areas are the San Joaquin Valley of California and south central Arizona. And there are a couple um, counties and areas that have been added onto this map since the Edwards and Palmer study. Uh, one of those areas being the southeastern portion of Washington state. Those were added on after several case reports from this area. So it's largely a fungus that lives in the dry desert environments. Next slide. I will caveat that um, since this study, um, 
after 2019, the CDC has updated their endemicity map to depict a larger geographical range likely for coccidioides to live. Uh, the areas in darker orange are where they're more likely to live. And then they also depict much of the Western United States as the potential range. Uh, so just wanna throw a caveat that the map has been updated since our study was published. Next slide. So in the United States, uh, climate change um, is expected to increase temperatures and shift areas of precipitation. So looking at a high greenhouse gas emissions, high climate warming scenario, one that we refer to as uh, RCP 8.5, Mean annual temperatures throughout the contiguous United States are expected to increase by three to six degrees Celsius, with the largest warming happening in the more northern latitudes. And mean annual precipitation is expected to shift regionally. So while much of the eastern United States is expected to become wetter, much of the western United States will stay about the same. Uh, the Pacific Northwest may get a little bit wetter, whereas the southwestern and extreme southern United States may become drier in the future. Next slide. So this warming and shift in precipitation may shift the geographical range of valley fever and what population is at risk, since we know that this disease is largely limited to those semi-arid regions. Next slide. So our study looked at one, currently where may valley fever be endemic? Could we build upon that Edwards and Palmer study to create uh, an estimate of endemicity based on recent case counts and climate constraints? And if so, two, where might valley fever be endemic in the future? Next slide. So for this study, we gathered valley fever case data um, that was available for the southwestern United States. Uh, this included the states of California, Nevada, Utah, New Mexico, and Arizona. And this was from the state health agencies. We gathered this from 2000 to 2015 at the county level by month. And over these 16 years, this included almost 150,000 cases of valley fever. And the top right is a map of mean annual valley fever incidence. So this is cases normalized by population or cases per 100,000 population per year. And the darker red colors are higher incidence values. And so this lights up the San Joaquin Valley of California and much of the state of Arizona. Um, and compared to the CDC valley fever endemicity map on the bottom, there's already some differences um, showing a potential further, further range northward than the CDC uh, endemicity map from Edwards and Palmer. Next slide. So what we did next was take the county level incidence data and compare it to county level climate data. And two of the strongest relationships that popped out were with mean annual temperature and mean annual precipitation. So this slide shows two scatter graphs. On the left-hand side is mean annual temperature along the x-axis against mean annual valley fever incidence on the y-axis. And on the right-hand side is mean annual precipitation on the x-axis, where each of these dots is one of the counties in our study area of the southwestern United States. And what we saw was that there's these two main climate controls, temperature and precipitation. There's a nonlinear positive relationship between temperature and incidence. So counties that have higher mean annual temperatures had higher levels of incidence and a nonlinear negative relationship between precipitation and incidence. So counties that are drier had higher levels of incidence. And this largely aligns with what we know about coccidioides. It's living in the hot and dry areas. So we next wanted to define an endemicity threshold for the counties. Um, so which counties we would uh, define in our study as endemic. And we picked the threshold of 10 cases per 100,000 population per year. And when we looked at this threshold, we found that all counties that met that endemicity definition had mean annual temperatures above 10.7 degrees Celsius 
and mean annual precipitation levels below 600 millimeters per year. Next slide. So we can map these thresholds out in geographic space. So in this map, the counties that are highlighted in red all have mean annual temperatures above 10.7 degrees Celsius. And this highlights most of the counties in the southern half of the contiguous United States. Uh, next slide. We could do the same thing for mean annual precipitation. So the counties here highlighted in blue uh, have mean annual precipitation levels less than 600 millimeters per year. And this highlights a majority of the western half of the United States. Next slide. And if we combine these two thresholds together, this highlights the area that we could consider potentially endemic for valley fever based on these climate constraints. So that's the area highlighted in magenta where both these thresholds are met. And this largely spans the southwestern United States. It includes 217 counties across 12 different states. And based on 2010 population estimates, uh, which was relevant for the time of the study, um, included almost 52 million people living within this region. Next slide. So I pulled over the magenta uh, endemic region highlighted by our model to this next slide on the top and compared it to the CDC endemicity map by Edwards and Palmer from 1957. I'm comparing the two maps, our endemicity map extends the area for valley fever further north than the CDC map, especially throughout the Central Plains, also throughout the Central Valley of California, and picks a few counties in Idaho and Utah um, as potentially endemic that the CDC did not highlight in their map. Something of particular interest is that these same three counties highlighted in the CDC Edwards and Palmer map are also highlighted in our climate constrained model as potentially endemic. So it gave us some confidence that our uh, simple climate niche model was picking out the areas that were suitable for coccidioides to live and therefore valley fever to be endemic. Next slide. So the next step in this research was using this simple climate constrained niche model to estimate or project where might valley fever be endemic in the future. Next slide. So we used climate projections for a high greenhouse gas emissions, high climate warming scenario, and fed it into our model and repeated the same analysis where we highlighted counties that met both of those thresholds of having temperatures above 10.7 degrees Celsius and mean annual precipitation below 600 millimeters per year. And what we found is that valley fever endemicity travels north throughout the 21st century. Uh, so the uh, areas that become endemic, um, or valley fever is once a, a southwestern disease, it might be a western United States disease in the future. So the areas that were uh, that did not become endemic or were saved from endemicity in the future were uh, the cold Rockies and the wetter Pacific coast. Uh, the disease also is suppressed from uh, traveling into the eastern half of the United States, and this is because of the dry lines. So this is a, a climatological area where we have warmer, moister air coming up from the Gulf of Mexico that keeps the eastern half of the United States much wetter than the western half. Next slide. Um, so I'm not going into details here, but we did also look into um, a moderate greenhouse uh, gas emissions, moderate climate warming scenario, and translate this uh, projection of the endemic area into case counts in our paper. And what we found was reducing greenhouse gas emissions may reduce the health burden of valley fever, where a uh, lower greenhouse gas emissions scenario resulted in 
a lower projection of case counts in the future. Next slide. So in conclusion, uh, we found that the area endemic to valley fever may already extend further north than previously thought. Um, the CDC since 2019 did update their endemicity map and it is in agreement uh, with our findings from the study. And then we found that valley fever may be endemic to much of the western United States in the future. We found a 54% increase in the number of endemic counties from 217 from our baseline to 476 counties potentially endemic by the end of the 21st century for that high greenhouse gas emissions, high climate warming scenario. Um, so I linked, um, or I put the uh, citation for our paper that goes into details about this study at the bottom here, and I'm happy to answer any questions by email as well. Thank you so much for joining today. Thank you. Next slide, please. Our final presentation, Integrating Public Health Surveillance and Environmental Data to Model the Presence of Histoplasma, is by Dr. Kimberly Kozo. Please begin when you're ready. Thank you. Um, thanks for having me. I'm going to be talking about another type of thing about mycosis in terms of fungal diseases. And next slide. So I'm going to be talking about histoplasmosis, and it's a pulmonary infection caused by the environmental fungus, histoplasma. And the CDC estimates about 90% of people living in the endemic regions have been exposed to this histoplasmosis. And basically, it's aerosolized by soil disruption. So there is a description of the biology of histoplasmosis that the CDC has provided. But in stage one, you have these birds and bats, which end up having um, their guano or their bird poop that ends up having nitrogen, and the histoplasma ends up growing in there. And so these spores end up breathing in in stage two from the host-related form. And then from that, once we breathe it in, it gets into the lungs, it gets into the lymph nodes and part of the blood. And after it gets into the body, then it just says that it's around. And some people don't have any symptoms of what histoplasmosis is and um, they don't show any signs, but it can be in a really large area. So the estimated areas of histoplasmosis is really large. They end up having like the whole Mississippi River Valley, but about half of the United States. But it's still, a disease where the geographical distribution is a little poorly understood, we have this idea that it can be in these other areas, but do we have any sense of like a risk or how bad it can be in some areas versus others? And part of it is, is because there's misdiagnosis. This is kind of like a flu or a cold where you have symptoms that are just like fever, cough, fatigue, body aches. And so there's, it's misdiagnosed and then underreported in that cases. And some states will report while others won't. Next slide. Some of the risk factors that come along with this for histoplasmosis is environmental. So if you live in the endemic region, which is going to be a lot of the Mississippi River Valley areas, maybe some of the East Coast, is um, you have this presence of bird or bat droppings. And just showing a map of the bat range is there's a lot of bats in the area and they, um, there's just some seasonality with them, but just showing an example of a northern long-eared bat range, which would be on the top figure, talks about where they would be, and so there's it's almost in everywhere where the endemic region is. Um, but also in terms of birds, they have a migratory pattern, and there's an abundance that's really high in some of the areas and not. The example of the barn swallow, there's an abundance of the map of the US and just showing that there's regions that are purple that are going to be a lot higher counts than some other areas. Other occupational hazards that could come up is in farms. Um, if you're a farmer, you're going to be more susceptible to it potentially because you're turning up the soil. Also, it's more nitrogen rich because of the crops. The chicken coops, so if you have a lot of exposure you're going to the chicken coops, that's another one where you're gonna have access to some of the birds. And so histoplasma can grow there. Construction again, because you're turning up some of the soil. But then the ones that are most susceptible are going to be those that are immunocompromised. So people who are on the immunotherapy drugs and HIV and AIDS, which there is a higher population that are going to expose to this at that point. Next slide. Now, where is this data? The data isn't abundant. There is some that's been occurring in the past and studies have recorded some of these cases from newspaper articles or clippings. 
And, um, but it's still kind of poorly understood. So there's a historical cases of histoplasmosis from 1938 to 2013. And it shows like the red dots are going to be outbreak locations and some higher counts in terms of the green, which is top figure. However, this is cases like have come from reportings or clippings and not well categorized. And so it's not um, uniformly collected in terms of this time period. Another study that came up in terms of looking at reported cases, there was like a real big surveillance effort to look for histoplasmosis in 2011 to 2014. And in the lower figure, and Armstrong ended up looking at the average rate of cases, and so more of your incidence rate, so how many people you have in a particular area. And it's not all states, because it's not all states are reporting histoplasmosis. So you have some higher areas that are going to be in Minnesota, you have some in Nebraska, you have Illinois, Michigan, these cases that occur. But part of this is we have some gaps, like the, Iowa, even though it doesn't report, may actually have some cases in there. It's just we don't have the data for some of that. And so the, trying to use the data that we have, or data rich, to kind of figure out what is the risk that we have for the environmental of histoplasma growing to help us to understand histoplasmosis. And some other things that come as the environment is changing. We do have a changing climate. And then the changing bird of bat migration patterns can change. So thinking about if we can understand what it's like now, we can think about what that would be like in the future. Next slide. So based, the aim of this is to better understand the geographical distribution of histoplasma. Histoplasma is the driver for histoplasmosis. So can we project the disease risk of histoplasmosis by understanding drivers that lead to the presence of histoplasma? Two ways we're going to do this. One way is going to be incorporate bird data by spatially smoothing seasonal bird counts. Capturing bird data or other information that are migratory um, and environmental drivers, since they're a big predictor in here, is can be difficult because of the data sources that you have. And then second is to think about a model that incorporates all these different potential sources that have been known, like nitrogen, water, crops, soil moisture, and other demographic demographic information into the model to say, what is the information that drives histoplasma, maybe the environmental drivers that can lead to like the histoplasmosis cases. So this model that we're gonna do is gonna incorporate a couple levels. Next slide. So first of all, is to understand the distribution of birds in the US. There's a large database that comes along eBird, a database that citizen science, which people end up collecting the, the birds and type of data. And what you'll find is that there's a little bias. And if you look at snapshots of different time periods, so like in January, one day, and then we have something that's going to be in April, um, that the spread, like we have these gray areas, which is missing data. This alpha level is actually how many birds we have in a particular area, but it doesn't look smooth. There's nothing, there's like hot spots, which look in populated areas. You found the Chicago area. A birding area up in Duluth is one that's very popular, but there's not really a nice surface to kind of say, this is where we expect it to be. And if there's some birds in one area, likely it's another county, but you just have this difference between urban and rural. And so if look, we look at all a bunch of states, and this is 25 states, um, looking from 2011 to 2014, we're trying to use this information to fill in areas where we didn't have data to say, do we have a bird distribution? And then maybe use that to help us inform if we have a lot of birds in that area, is that something that kicks into histoplasmosis and has some impact? So next slide. So to smooth the surface and think about really what the bird distribution is, is that the data isn't that rich at the at daily scale. So we put it into a quarterly scale to think about are there seasons so that are going to be a little bit higher for bird diversity than others? So the first row in both of these is going to be the year 2011 to 2014. And then um, the first column is going to be the first quarter, second column, second quarter, third column is going to be third and so forth. So there's four quarters in a year, which is going to be associated with like winter, spring, summer, and fall. Now we're getting a signal that it's a lot higher that's going to be bird abundance in the spring season 
And we have a much smoother surface where we have like a lot higher counts. We can see pockets of where we can fill in the gaps and have a better estimation for like if a county has a high abundance of birds, maybe that has an impact later on for either the growth of histoplasma or histoplasmosis. Next slide. So the model that I'm going to end up using is occupancy model. Um, this actually comes from ecology work and it's modeling the presence and absence. Since histoplasmosis, the cases that we have are not, um, the true counts may not be completely represented or taking a take of like, is it there or is it not as a first take? And then we can estimate the probability of risk that it's going to be there. So it accounts for the imperfect detection of the cases because what we're trying to do is estimate the risk that histoplasmosis exists in a county at a particular time. And so the cases provide some information about this, but then we also need some environmental drivers for that. But what happens with some of the surveillance data is that we have this case where uh, histoplasmosis is present, but in the case there's no reported cases, it truly could be that histoplasmosis is not present, but we could also have that histoplasmosis is present, but it just wasn't reported in that case. So we're really trying to incorporate the modeling of like, if there's environmental drivers that say this is a really high signal, then it will up the probability that histoplasmosis can be there. Next slide. So the notation for some of this, I'm just going to give cases instead of getting into more of the math that comes down to kind of a basis of a logistic model. But I'm thinking about the fungus. So there's two different types of the model, which is detection. Did we detect histoplasmosis? And then there's an occupancy. And the occupancy is associated, is the fungus really there? So thinking about this in terms of the cases, we can have case one where the fungus histo um, plasma is there, is absence, so there's no reported cases of histoplasmosis. So if you don't have any sense that the environmental drivers say that it's suitable for this environment, you just really can't have histoplasmosis cases. But what is the case that we're likely to have is that you have the fungus is potentially present, and we have a really higher probability there. And so then that means that histoplasmosis can be could have been reported or not. Um, and so we have some data that's going to be reported on this yearly or monthly level and we're trying to incorporate these two different levels and say, what do we end up getting to this estimated type of risk? Next slide. So what we can do is we can look at state level differences and detection effects. So detection just comes down to what's the probability of um, histoplasmosis given that histoplasma was there. And then we have these different intercepts. What this is really just telling is that there are differences across states as we would expect. And Delaware has the biggest intercept because there's not a lot of data that was there. There were only a few cases. And so it just has a really wide margin where some of the other ones are tighter and they just have a little bit more data in those regions. But what you're kind of seeing on here for the detection is that there's a lot of drivers in here in terms of insurance and population and so you see these pockets of like Chicago area, Minneapolis, where you're going to have a higher detection. So it's that histoplasmosis is likely there given histoplasma is there. But Nebraska is interesting because there was no data in part of Nebraska, but we still have a higher risk that histoplasmosis is there. And that's kind of where that trigger is. Some of the other states, we don't have data and why that is. And next slide. But then thinking about this in terms of how do we incorporate the bird data, and this goes back to what's the probability that histoplasma is going to be there. We didn't have all of the data in the whole coast, so we had, didn't have regions in Iowa, we didn't have regions in Mississippi, other areas didn't report the information, but we can fill in those gaps and say, okay, well, we have this environmental data and we have this everywhere, but this is some regions where we expect it might be, and say, we can go to the East Coast, and we get these pockets, it's like, here's some sort of a risk. So the higher, the more purple is going to be higher risk of having the fungus in the area versus not. So that would associate with like, if that's high, then likely you're also going to have histoplasmosis there. So we can really get this map of like, where are areas we should think about and surveillance should be. Iowa didn't have any information, but if you look at how high a histoplasmosis case could be there, it's, it's high in that region and they have a lot of red, so higher probability in that particular region. So kind of filling in using the information that we have. And that can help inform us to say, maybe that can help some of the surveillance efforts in those particular regions. And also notify like public health workers and say that maybe we should test for it in these particular regions. Next slide. 
So kind of summarizing up in some of this is that we use some sort of model to understand that the occupancy of maybe the fungus, the histoplasma, and there was a little bit higher if you had nitrogen content in the farms or non-farms, um, then you end up having a higher probability of having the histoplasma. Nitrogen has been known in previous articles, we still have that. Percent of the county covered by water is another indicator, a higher indicator, and definitely the number of birds in the region has an impact. Also, populated areas are more likely to have reported cases of histoplasmosis, given the presence that you have histoplasma. Not too surprising, there's more hospitals in particular areas. And then also we see that there's actually a probability of presence of this fungus in the northern part of the study region. So we do have a lot of regions that we didn't have surveillance data of saying that it's likely in these areas, kind of matches up with like this other blanket map of CDC saying there's some areas kind of across the country that we have. Um, and then there's differences by state in terms of the detection probability. So we just we can account for the differences in state by state reporting. And some of the work to trying to move forward is just thinking about this disease risk in terms of how it changes with the climate scenarios and different bird patterns and moving forward. And just to kind of think about more of that community risk and health information to assess the risk of what it is. And next slide. And I just want to thank my colleagues. I've worked with some other colleagues that are at Wake Forest, the medical school and university, and then also CDC for working and helping out with some of the information on this. Next slide. All right, that is the end of mine. Thank you. Um, next slide, please. I have some extra references, but we can skip past this, so I apologize. Okay. It's back up. Okay. All right, thank you. Um, our final present, uh, excuse me, thanks to all of today's speakers for their informative presentations. Um, we have links to resources from each presentation available on our website at cdc.gov slash one health slash zohu slash 2022 slash September dot HTML. We do have time for a few questions. And as a reminder, please use the Q&A feature in Zoom to send your question um, and include the presenter's name or topic. So we will begin with a question for Dr. Um, Grome. Is rabies post-exposure prophylaxis still offered when there has been a long lapse in the time of exposure and the time of recon recognition that rabies exposure occurred? Um, is there a cutoff period where it's too late to administer post-exposure prophylaxis? Yeah, thanks. So the decision to offer RPEP can be fairly complex, um, especially because the incubation period in humans varies. So um, the range for the incubation period in humans is like some, uh, maybe a week to as long as six years, but it's typically uh, two to four months, I believe. And a lot of it has to do with um, the information surrounding the exposure that the person had to the animal. So um, specifically in this case, even though it was, um, we were learning more information about these exposures um, several months after their known exposure may have occurred, um, we had a pretty low threshold for giving vaccination, um, especially because we knew the animal was um, confirmed to have rabies. And so um, in part, we just had a very low threshold for um, recommending RPEP after we did the exposure assessments on all of the individuals. And it also made it um, easier for us because we were able to get in contact with all of these people and um, they were also in agreement with wanting to receive RPEP. So, um, the short answer is just um, there is no specific time frame for if it's too long of a lapse to give our pep. There really is no defined um, quote too long period. Thank you. And we do have another question. We've had a few questions for you, Dr. Gurm, regarding um, the period of rabies shedding. Um, so one question asks. Uh, we don't really know the period of rabies shedding before onset of clinical signs in anteaters, correct? And um, another question also mentions um, low body temperature. Might that help explain why this animal possibly lived longer than one might expect? Hmm. Right, so the, that's correct for the first question, which was um, 
we don't know the incubation period or period of viral shedding in Tamandua. We actually um, were, came up to a decision for the viral shedding period in consultation with the experts at CDC. And so um, in, for example, like in domestic animals, it's much shorter um, viral shedding period. They, they shed virus maybe four to five days before uh, symptom onset. But in this animal, we didn't have any good data on how long they might have had virus shedding. So we um, just were extra cautious and um, recommended doing were recommended to do about two weeks prior to just to give a nice buffer on either side. Um, and the second question was about um, the basal body temperature being lower in anteaters and if that might have caused a prolongation of um, basically symptoms. And we're really not sure there isn't any other data um, or any other case studies really available about um, rabies signs and symptoms in these animals. So um, perhaps that could have caused a change in symptom, but we're, we're not sure. Thank you. And our next question is for Dr. Boris. Um, did your case numbers include cases identified in animals or only in people? Hey there. So <clears throat> our, our study only looked at cases in humans. Um, and even so, we do not have a great estimate of the true number of cases since valley fever is uh, definitely underdiagnosed and underreported. Um, I do want to mention that valley fever does affect animals. Um, it has been documented in wildlife, um, like armadillos, mountain lions, dolphins, sea lions. Uh, it's been documented in livestock, pigs, cattle, sheep, llamas, um, companion animals, especially dogs, um, and non-native animals in captivity, uh, like primates, tigers, rhinos, kangaroo, et cetera. Uh, there's a wonderful write-up by Bridget Barker from 2018 called Coccidioidomycosis in Animals for, for, for the reference. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a question for Dr. Cofield. Um, have you or will you be looking at the Western US regarding histoplasma presence? That's a great question. That one's a hard one because we don't have any data to verify anything over there. We can try and uh, do the best we can to interpolate why that would be over there. But the problem is, is that we have uncertainty. So in terms of our standard errors would be really large that it wouldn't really have any difference of the average versus not. So it would just kind of probably be more like we think it might be there versus not. If there's any data that's in the sources of those regions, so we can update this and say it's probably a better feature. But we only expanded out to regions where we felt comfortable that like it was reasonable to say this is our area um, that might have it. Thank you. And we have a question addressed to both Dr. Gorris and Dr. Cofield, and we'll start with you, Dr. Gorris. Um, what kinds of data do you think are needed to better estimate endemicity and potential effects of climate change? Thank you for that question. Um, something that's been very challenging uh, to, to study uh, human health and climate change related issues is disease surveillance data. Uh, we know that there are just inherent issues that will always be present with disease surveillance data like under ascertainment and under reporting. Um, but there are areas where we have uh, strong scientific evidence to suggest that it's endemic for a particular disease and the region or state does not have disease surveillance programs in place. Um, so this, this uh, study, I hope, will uh, motivate areas to have surveillance programs for valley fever, and that's true of other diseases as well. Uh, Kim, do you have anything to add on? I totally agree. I think the hope was that in some of this is that areas will start to have surveillance metrics to realize that the potential is really there and to help. And that's the same with like even the Western area. If we don't know, we can't really estimate what that is and to kind of get the public health message out. Thank you, both of you. Um, so we have time for one more question and we'll go back to Dr. Groom. Um, is rabies testing standard for necropsies? How was rabies testing indicated if rabies had not been previously documented in this species? Yeah, so in this case, because the sample was coming from a, a zoologic institution, um, it went for a necropsy um, because of the desire to just study more and, and learn more about disease process in the uncommon, uncommon species. 
So whenever the animal was undergoing the necropsy um, at this teaching institution, the residents typically have about four to five weeks to um, review their histopathology and, and discuss it with the pathologist. And it was actually during their discussion with the pathologist that um, there was uh, basically concern for rabies virus infection, like uh, viral inclusions within the brain tissue. Um, and recall those are um, basically findings within the cytoplasm of cells that indicate uh, infection with rabies and neurons. And so it was after that time that rabies was actually added to the differential and it, the brain tissue was sent to um, a separate clinical lab for testing and testing was requested, but it took a while to even be um, requested because of that lag between the review of these slides and discussion with the on-staff pathologist. Um, so it's kind of a roundabout way, but um, that's correct. Rabies wasn't originally on the differential when the animal died. Thank you. And that's all the time we have today for questions. Um, thank you again to our presenters. If you have other questions for today's presenters, we have included their email addresses on this slide, on the Zohu Call webpage for today's webinar, and in today's email newsletter. Also a reminder that a video of today's webinar will be posted within 30 days. Next slide. We hope you'll join us again for the next Sohu call on October 5th. Thank you all for your participation. This ends today's webinar.